today's prophecy in the news, we're going to take another look at John chapter 13, the Last Supper. John spends four chapters here discussing the teachings of Jesus during this Last Supper. Therefore, this must be a most important part of his gospel. We have seen one Passover in chapter 2 of John's gospel that alludes to the first cup of the Passover. We have seen the second Passover in John chapter 6, which alludes to the second cup in the Afikomen. We now see the third Passover here in chapter 13, which alludes to the third cup, the cup of redemption. Now these, there are four cups at each Passover table. John's gospel here gives us three. At one time, I was an advocate for four Passovers, and that was because in John chapter 5, verse 1, the Jews talked about a feast of the Jews, John here tells us, but nowhere does John call this a Passover. So in the final analysis, after looking at the situation here for several years now, I've finally come to the conclusion that there are three Passovers. I do believe that, that Jesus' ministry covered three and a half years. But I, and I do believe that the four cups are seen in John's writings, but the fourth one is seen in the book of Revelation. Gary uh, Stearman is here to discuss with me these four cups of the Passover. Mm. And J.R., the interesting thing about the four cups of the Passover, to briefly review uh, the Passover Seder, the first cup, second, third, fourth, start back at uh, the Exodus in the ritual of the freeing of the people from Pharaoh, crossing the Red Sea, and so forth. And actually, that by the fourth cup, they end with the coming of Christ and the cry next year in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. In other words, the kingdom. Yes, the fourth cup yeah. is the kingdom of heaven. Absolutely. With the resurrection, establishment of the Messianic kingdom. Exactly. And for that reason, since the Gospel of John does not deal with the second coming or the kingdom, it seems logical then the subject of John is redemption, cup of redemption, the third cup is the most important. It's here in John 13, and that mm -hmm. we wait until we get to Revelation, the marriage supper of the Lamb, before we come to that fourth cup. And by the yes. way, didn't he say, I, I won't drink another cup with you until I drink it new? In he the did. So Jesus stopped this particular Last Supper <clears throat> with the end of the third cup. Mm -hmm. Then he said, let us go hence. And right. they went out then toward, into the night toward uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, this third cup of redemption is always taken at the, in the Jewish Passover table with the afikomen, which is broken up into little pieces of unleavened bread. And each person takes a piece and takes the unleavened bread and drinks the third cup, the cup of redemption. Well, Gary, that's the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. That is the, is the very part that Jesus established as the ordinance by which we should remember him until he Mm -hmm. And this word afikomen, this little piece of uh, unleavened bread that was hidden away through the meal, then found by the children, brought back to the table, then uh, uh, taken with the third cup, means I come in Greek. It does. And so it represents the second coming, doesn't it? It does. And by the way, the, the uh, Thayer Greek uh, lexicon of the New Testament clearly displays in the, in the uh, table of uh, reductions, afi koman means I come. Yes, so. and, uh, and in next month when we look at chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled, you know, he says, I will come again. Mm -hmm. That's the meaning of the afi koman there. Indeed it is. Now, with that uh, having been said, and the fact that we are now in John 13, which deals with this cup of redemption, Let's go ahead and uh, review the Passovers and move forward into uh, the rest of John 13. Mm -hmm. Because the first Passover, turning water into wine, uh, cleaning uh, the leaven out of the temple when he turned over the money changers' tables. Yes. The second Passover, John 6, where he came as the bread of life. And by the way, that's where the bread is that's, broken. That's the cup of thanksgiving where they break the bread mm -hmm. and hide the afikomen. And of course, John's third Passover is right here in John 13. And this uh, uh, is where he really institutes the cup of the New Testament mm -hmm. in his blood. Now, this is an amazing thing because we Christians down through the 
church era take what we call communion without really associating it with this cup of redemption. Uh, but remember the wording of the, of the cup of communion. We are breaking the bread, drinking the cup, in order to remember his death until he comes. So there's a prophetic aspect mm -hmm. to it. Yes. Now there is a short-term prophecy here because when the afikoman is hidden, it's like uh, his body uh, was typified by the unleavened bread. Uh, we see the stripes uh, on, and the uh, piercing of that unleavened bread. We see the uh, brown spots, the striping. And uh, so we see the death burial. We see the burial of Christ uh, the very next day, which was the uh, ob observation of the week of unleavened bread. And then we see his resurrection as coming forth again. And so I come refers first to his resurrection after three days in the grave and ultimately to his return at the end of the age when he raises the rest of us. So his resurrection, Gary, was a first fruits of the future resurrection when the rest of us will be given new bodies, immortal bodies, and uh, live forever. It's, it's a beautiful story here in the Jewish Passover. Now let's briefly review. <clears throat> the way chapter 13 opens, verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover. Verse 2 says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Uh, J.R., this is before the feast and supper being ended. These two phrases uh, then mm -hmm. seem to surround this incident of the, of the foot washing. Yes. Jesus gets up from the supper. This is time for the washing of the hands, but Jesus then washes their feet instead. Mm -hmm. They don't understand this. Jesus says, you don't understand it now, but you will understand it later. And he comes to Peter. I, uh, there are a number of commentaries that say Peter was the first one he came to. Mm -hmm. And the reason uh, Augustine, for example, said that Peter was the first one, Eusebius, Jerome, Augustine, all those early church fathers wrote about this, and they, they decided that um, Peter had to be the first one because if he had been the uh, fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth, mm -hmm. he'd have been running off at the mouth during all this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't do that. You're not going to wash me. You're not going to wash my feet. You know, <laughs> he would have been protesting. So evidently Jesus came to Peter first of all. And Peter uh, said, no, no, you're not going to wash my feet. Uh, you know, he's seeing his boss. Mm -hmm. fixing to wash his feet. This is, this is the other way around. He's the one that should be washing Jesus' feet. And he knows this, and he feels this, and he feels humiliated in, uh, in a respect. I mean, he does not feel worthy that this great uh, raiser of the dead, this miracle-working son of the living God, could stoop to wash his feet. Oh, please, not my feet. Let me wash your feet, you know. Well, J.R., what happens here is that uh, <clears throat> the, the cup has now been turned from uh, a, a simple historical rendering that points to the future into an actual living relationship with Christ. He turned the taking of cups, the washing of hands from simple ritual into an actual relationship where he actually came and washed their feet demonstrating sanctification, that is, the daily foot washing of everyone who comes to him by faith. He still washes the feet of the believers, and that's yes. you and that's me. Yes. Now, notice that he said, ye are clean, but not all. Now, there's a double meaning there in not all, because uh, uh, Judas Iscariot was one of them who was not clean. Mm. The only one not clean. But he said, ye are clean. Uh, this, is, uh, to me, is the security of the believer. Yes. He is not saying that we have to have a, uh, a renewal of our salvation. Um, he's simply saying that we, we may be clean, but we have daily problems that need to be taken before the Lord and cleaned up. And to renew our fellowship with him. And uh, so this, I think, is what he's referring to. And in particular, he said, I give you a new commandment. Gary, this new commandment is most important for us to understand. Because uh, over in uh, Romans chapter 13, uh, in the love chapter, mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul talked about love being the fulfillment of the law. Didn't Absolutely. He? Well, if love, is, if that's all it is, it's the fulfillment of the law, then uh, this was not a new commandment. 
You may recall Jesus said all the law can be wrapped up into two things, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. But that's not what he's saying here. He's saying I give you a new commandment. And I want to discuss this at some length when we come back in just a moment. Mm. Because this new commandment meant that it was a special fellowship because of our relationship through the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not a part of the law. This is grace. We'll be back in just a moment. Jesus told his disciples that he would give to them a new commandment. We know that the old commandment, that is the Mosaic law, uh, could be summed up in loving God and loving thy neighbor as thyself. This new commandment does not mean love your neighbor as yourself. This commandment means love the brethren because I love you. So this is different in that respect. It is a commandment by which men might know that we are Christians, that we've been born again, something different about us. It's not that we love the average person or that we send missionaries out to reach the world or that we build hospitals to heal the sick or that we take up food to feed the hungry. No, if we love each other, then uh, men will know that we are his disciples. Oh, Gary, we've forgotten that. We have indeed. Uh, there's so little love among Christians today, isn't Isn't that there? the truth? But, J.R., uh, the, the bright side of this, I suppose, is that if you look at the world today, and it's a sad place because it's de degenerating very rapidly. It doesn't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to observe that. In spite of all that, there are examples of love, and they invariably come from the Christian community. For example, the love of the nation Israel. Uh, Israel is not loved. The Jews are not beloved people. And yet their friends are Bible-believing evangelical Christians because yes. they love God's people in, in an unconditional way. So there are many examples of love today. Yes, Gary, we find it so easy to love other people. We find it easy to love the unlovely, mm. uh, the, the sinners. We go out and try to reach them with the gospel. But when it comes to each other, <laughs> we, we shoot our wounded, folks. That is true. Now, please understand, this is the new commandment that Jesus said the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. But just let uh, some minister you know say something wrong in the pulpit. The congregation is ready to string him up. <clears throat> well, that's true. And, uh, and we have so little tolerance with other theologians as well. Um, you know, if your stripes don't run the same way my stripes do, or mm. if you have a, a problem with a uh, with a particular theology that I don't agree with. I'm not going to have anything to do with you, you know. This is not what Jesus wanted. Just think, Jesus was willing to wash those disciples' feet when he knew that one of them was going out to betray him and another one of them would betray him or deny him before the morning sun broke over the eastern horizon. Not once, not twice, but three times. Oh, what love. No wonder the Bible emphasizes here he loved them unto the end. You know, J.R., uh, I think we should park here just a little while because in the very context of Jesus saying, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. That's John 13, 34. In that context, we have the incident of Judas Iscariot being uncovered, being yes. exposed. Uh, of course, Jesus always knew, but, but uh, the incident of his, uh, shall we say, his final disclosure, I guess, came at this particular Passover. That's a mm -hmm. signal moment. In other words, uh, at the moment when love was expressed in the highest sort of way, that's when Judas split the scene mm -hmm. and he was gone. That's a lesson. There's an amazing lesson there. And you know, when Jesus said, uh, one of you will betray me, Peter felt this sudden conviction inside. Yes. He motioned to John, who was across the table uh, reclining next to Jesus. Psst, hey, uh, ask him who it is. Mm -hmm. You know. So he leans over and, and gets Jesus' ear. Who is it, Lord? 
And Jesus leans down and tells just him, it's the one to whom I give the sop. Mm -hmm. Peter must have felt something was wrong with his own spirituality. And he, it, it showed up the next morning when he denied Jesus, mm -hmm. denied knowing Jesus three times. Yeah. And so there, there must have been something wrong with Peter's uh, spirituality here. Well, you know, Peter's an example of someone who tries very, very hard. And mm -hmm. he did. And I think he was exemplary for that. Yes. But, you know, when you try in your own strength, you often fail. And what a lesson Peter is to us. You know, J.R., uh, <clears throat> here we have, uh, we have a statement in John. Uh, some of them thought, verse 29, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things which uh, we have need of against the feast. In other words, he was going out to buy more provisions because yes. he was the treasurer of the group. So there was, even at this point, uh, many of the disciples were still absolutely in the dark about what was really going on. But isn't it amazing it's near midnight? <laughs> what supermarket is he going to find open? That's true. You know, what 7-Eleven is he going to be able to go to? And yet, uh, their minds were clouded. Uh, you see, Judas Iscariot was able to cover up his betrayal and, and his um, sinfulness uh, by, through his hypocrisy until nobody had a clue that he wasn't one of them. Mm -hmm. They just all, well, no. Uh, he could never do that. Why, he was a good man. Why, I've been with him for three years. He couldn't possibly, Lord, who is it? In fact, another of the Gospels says they begin to ask, oh, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it me? Am I the one? You know, it just sort of passed around. And uh, uh, Jesus uh, kept, kept it a secret, but he turned to Judas and said, That thou doest, do quickly. Mm -hmm. And he left the room. I know Judas Iscariot knew that Jesus knew at that point. He Absolutely. Went out. He mm -hmm. went out into the, the night, determined he wanted that 30 shekels of silver, determined to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, um, where are you going? He, he mentions to them, you know, he says, whether I go, you cannot come. Lord, where are you going? And of course, the next chapter, he, he will get into that more, is that I go away, my father's house with many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus answered him, Where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why can't I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. And Jesus looked him right in the eye and said, Peter, you really going to lay down your life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Mm. Jesus knew the future, Gary. Yes, he did. He knew before the Passover, he had every moment already charted exactly what was going to happen every moment for the next several hours. And J.R., in a remarkable way, in chapter 13 of John, we find an intersection between law and grace. Uh, for example, <clears throat> and you've, let me just quote uh, your article here. You, you have a paragraph. In the Mosaic Law, love is an expression of our effort to keep the law. Here, love is an expression of Christ loving others through us. There's a huge gulf between those two ideas. And also, in the Old Testament, silver is a metal uh, commonly associated with redemption. That is, in the tabernacle, the silver sockets are said to be symbols of redemption. Here we have the silver shekels, 30 of them. Yes. And they were the price of redemption. This is the act of redemption mm -hmm. under the law. Yes. Jesus took that upon himself and then to his disciples he said, you no longer have to keep the law. A new commandment I give to you. That's yeah. amazing. It is. And one last thing I don't want to forget. The Hebrew letter Mem is the 13th letter of the Hebrew alphabet and it corresponds to this 13th chapter of the Gospel of John. Mem means the revealed. And so here Jesus reveals Judas Iscariot is the one to betray him. Mm. And so this is a beautiful Revelation chapter. And by the way, chapter 13 of, of the book of Revelation corresponds with the same theme as this chapter 13 of the Gospel, as we have seen every chapter thus far corresponds. Mm -hmm. In Revelation 13, we have the revelation of the Antichrist, yes. the great betrayer. 
And many have said that the spirit of the Antichrist indwelt Judas Iscariot and would be later fully expressed in the person of the Antichrist. Now, whether you believe it or not, <clears throat> know this, that John 13 and Revelation 13 both reveal the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. They sure do. And so uh, this 13th chapter, I guess, is the great uh, pivotal chapter. It begins the uh, last 24 hours that we will see all the way through chapter 20 and uh, to the resurrection, from the crucifixion to the resurrection. So don't miss a single chapter as we look at them one by one. We'll be back in just a moment.